All right, depending on your political persuasion, uh, you are, there's good chances you're unhappy with the Republican leadership in Washington, D.C., or the Democrat leadership in Oregon. Uh, so unless you're totally apolitical, everybody here is unhappy with somebody. Because you don't agree with their policies, you might be tempted to resist and say, you know, I don't have to uh, do uh, what they say. But the Apostle Paul in our text today says we are to submit to government authorities. If you have your Bible, would you turn to Romans chapter 13? If you want to use our Bibles, it's on page 1,100. And 38. Uh, that Paul tells uh, Christians to submit to government authorities is significant because he's writing in the middle of Emperor Nero's reign. Uh, and under his government, there was increasing hostility toward Christians. And uh, uh, in, a, in a few years, he's going to be throwing Christians to lions and uh, having them burned at the stake. Uh, his counsel came as a surprise to some Christians. Uh, many Jews believed that they should not pay taxes to Rome, that they should only give to God, and some Christians uh, felt the same way. So in an environment unfriendly to Christians, what does Paul tell Christians their relationship with government should be? Today, at times, it appears that the U.S. government, federal government, the U.S. education system, particularly universities, uh, some leaders in Oregon are becoming increasingly hostile toward Christianity, sometimes seeing Christianity as a threat to the common good. So what does Paul suggest our relationship with the government should be? Paul says Christians are to submit to government authority. Why? Three reasons are given. One, because all government authority is established by God. Now, notice how many times he mentions that government is established by God. Why don't you read this with me? Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves." Three times, Paul mentions that all government authority is established by God. God knows human nature. God knows we need laws and we need authorities to uphold those laws. If there were no police, he knows we would run through stoplights or stop signs. Uh, we would drive faster and faster. Uh, one person said, uh, the last part of our body to get saved is our right foot. Without people in authority, things would get chaotic. So God established government to keep us from, you know, turning into anarchy. Therefore, governments serve God's purposes. Uh, governments need money to pay for their services. So Paul writes, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone that owe you owe, what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Uh, Paul teaches that we're to pay for the services we receive from government. We're also to respect our leaders. The second reason we're to submit to government authority is because government leaders are servants of God. Now, notice how many times he says that leaders in, in government are God's servants. Read this with me. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. They are God's servants and agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. For the authorities are God's servants. Again, three times he mentions that government leaders are his or God's servants. Um, God knows that without people in authority, uh, things would spin out of control. I mean, even today, I mean, even with people in authority, see how quickly things spin out of control? Paul says, if you do good, you don't need to fear the authorities. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. But if you do wrong, you need to fear, 
If you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. God instituted government to provide justice, protect the innocent, punish wrongdoers. The third reason we are to submit to government authority is because it gives you a greater opportunity to share Christ and your story. Uh, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Uh, the, the reason we are to obey authority is not just to avoid uh, being punished or getting caught, but to satisfy our own consciences. Uh, since we know that government has been a, a, a appointed by God, when we don't obey, our conscience tells us it's not right. One man wrote this note to the IRS, Ever since I mailed in my taxes, I haven't been able to sleep. So I'm sending you a check for $500 to pay for the taxes I owe. If I still am unable to sleep, I'll send you a check for the rest. <clears throat> if you want a clear conscience, obey the laws. Christians are be the most law-abiding citizens in the world. After Jory published her first book, The Power of Modeling, a gal called from the Midwest and said, hey, I love your book. Uh, gals in our church have been studying it. We're Xeroxing it and studying it. Hope you don't mind. Well, what was Jory supposed to say? I mean, if you're Xeroxing the book, the, the, the author doesn't get any royalties. Uh, some people have the idea that if you're doing something uh, for Christ in, you know, in a Christian context, then rules don't apply. If we obey the laws, we keep our conscience clear. So we're not embarrassed about Christ or to share our story. People may even ask, why do you live such a good life? One thing that will destroy your ability to share Christ and your story with other people is failing to distinguish between straight line issues and jagged line issues. Straight line issues are issues that God has talked about expressly in the Bible. Like murder. It's always wrong to murder. Uh, jagged line issues are ones that God has not specifically addressed. They're more nuanced and complicated. Uh, so much political dialogue between Christians to these, to these days thoughtlessly and divisively treats every issue as if it's a straight line issue. I mean, how many times do we hear Christians talk as if their position on health care, tax policy, immigration, or foreign policy is a straight line issue, that it's the only acceptable position that God endorses? Wow. When God hasn't expressly spoken on an issue, don't make pronouncements as if he has. I often hear pronouncements today about the whole issue of immigration and the caravan that's come from Central America. I hear Christians say, you know, these people came from such poor conditions, terrible conditions in their country. They're just trying to get a better life. The only right and compassionate thing to do is to let them in. Then they quote Bible verses like, God tells the, the Hebrew people in the Old Testament, accept the foreigner into your country, as if God is on their side, and there's only one way to look at things. When you turn all issues into straight-line issues, you are unable to see that there might be other sides to an issue, such as, in this case, that God is not in favor of chaos. He doesn't want people breaking the law. He doesn't want people jumping in line ahead of others who are trying to immigrate here legally. So if you take a jagged line issue that's difficult and nuanced and make it into a straight line issue, you cut off dialogue with somebody else with, with whom you might be trying to share your story and share Christ. Be careful about this. You know, when, when, when Christians make politics so important that it's kind of like the front front line in their discussion, they cut off opportunities to share Christ with people who may disagree with him. Paul's main point in this text is that Christians are to submit to government authority. Although Christians are to submit to government authorities, there are limits. No passage in the Bible stands alone. 
must be interpreted in the context of all the Bible. Romans 13 says we're to be subject to governing authorities, but we must interpret it in light of other passages in the Bible, which suggest some exceptions. Our journal writers uh, this week did a great job of introducing us to other passages in the Bible where followers of Christ did not obey government authorities. Uh, At the time of Paul's writing, uh, Rome served as a uh, restraining force against chaos. When government does that, it's God's servant. But when government applauds evil and punishes good, We have a responsibility to object, maybe resist. So for the next few minutes, I want you to just kind of go back in time with me and put yourself in someone else's shoes. Let's step through the time tunnel to 1760. You've been asked, you've grown up in England, you've been asked by your company to come and establish a branch in the 13 colonies of America. And so you come, and when you get here, you realize that England is really turning the screws on the 13 colonies. And uh, the revolution breaks out, and uh, war is declared. What do you do? Do you support the government? Uh, Does that mean your homeland, England, where you grew up and you were educated? Or do you support the colonies? You know, you now live here, you're running a company here, uh, your kids enjoy their new friends here. What do you do? Step through the time tunnel now to 1860. You own a plantation in southern Alabama. 12,000 acres of cotton, corn, and peaches. You have lots of slaves to do the work. Uh, Your wealth is increasing year after year. Things couldn't be better for you. Recently, you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, and now you struggle because your pastor, a man of uncommon courage, is speaking out against slavery. Your friends tell you there's nothing wrong with slavery, but in your conscience, you begin to wonder. The issue confronts you when a new president is elected in November of 1860. Your state secedes from the Union in February of 1861, and all-out war is declared in April. What do you do? Do you release your slaves, leave your homestead, and come north to fight for the Union? Or do you keep your slaves and fight for the Confederacy? You see, most of these issues are not simple. They're complicated. Fast forward to 1936. You're a Christian politician in Germany. Adolf Hitler spots you and sees your potential, so he elevates you. I mean, things have been dark for Germany since World War I. Now things are going better. Companies are doing well. Your company's turning a profit for the first time. And Germany's going to be put back on the map in 1936 when they uh, host the Olympics. Meanwhile, some of your Jewish friends have been forced to wear an ominous Star of David, and they've begun disappearing without explanation. With each day, you're pressured to show your support for the Third Reich. Should you support Hitler and the majority of your peers who do so? Or should you support the Jews, the treatment of the Jews and other undesirables. Your pastor, Martin Niemöller, has spoken out, and he's been against uh, Hitler, and he's been thrown in prison. You go to visit him, and he said, Martin, why are you in here? If you just keep your mouth shut, you could get out. And he says to you, why aren't you in here? Why aren't you speaking out? What do you do? Do you protect the Jews and openly stand against your government, or do you support the Nazi government? Fast forward to 2016, you're unhappy with the election results. You join a demonstration downtown in the Pearl District. Suddenly things turn ugly. Antifa joins in and they're breaking shop windows and spray painting walls and bashing in cars, windows. Do you stay there to voice your displeasure or do you get out of there as fast as you can? All these situations present us with the question, what is the Christian's duty to the government? Do we always support the government? Or are there times 
when the Christian commitment calls us to disobey. The scripture tells, tells us a number of times, and our journal writers uh, introduce us to these, when uh, there's a conflict between government and our Christian commitment, we're to obey God. I'll, I'll share four with you. Exodus 1, Pharaoh commanded the Hebrew midwives to kill all the Hebrew baby boys that were born. Did they obey? No. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Pharaoh was angry. God was pleased. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. In Daniel 6, uh, the administrators came up with a plan to trap Daniel. They came to King Darius and they say, make a rule for 30 days. No one can worship any god except you, King Darius. Well, that appealed to Darius, his pride, and so he says, sure, sounds great. Did Daniel obey? No, he continued his practice three times a day, praying through an open window to the God of Israel. As a result, he was thrown into a den of lions. Now, as it worked out, God protected him, and the administrators were actually thrown into the den of lions instead. In Acts 4, the apostles refused to obey the governing authorities, authorities when they commanded them to no longer speak about Christ. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. These are the religious leaders. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they've done an outstanding miracle. Uh, Peter and John um, healed a man who couldn't walk. Everybody knew this guy. It was an obvious miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men, to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Did Peter and John obey? No. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves, whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Their statement is in direct opposition to what the government leader told them to do, and God blessed them. And then Acts 5, having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, name of Jesus. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty about this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. So it's real clear we have a higher obligation to obey God rather than than government authorities. So I make two comments. One, the state loses its legitimate authority when it ceases to act as God's servant. Uh, God established government authority to punish wrong and to praise right. When it does just the opposite, it ceases to be God's servant. Uh, government authority is to protect us from chaos, but this authority is limited. When it ceases to perform its God-given task, it relinquishes its authority. Uh, Strive Misiyawa was one of the speakers at uh, this summer's leadership uh, summit, and he uh, grew up in Zimbabwe. He went to college, and he came out, and he went to work for a mobile phone company. He had a, a vision <clears throat> to see everybody in Zimbabwe to have cell phones. Uh, at, this was 1994. 75% uh, of people in Zimbabwe had never even heard a phone ring. Government had all the phones. And so he went into President Mugabe, and uh, Mugabe was unimpressed with his plan. Well, at that time, a Strive had just become a Christian. He said, I kept a Bible on my desk and a constitution. And even though the president was against my plan to try to get cell phones for, for all people, he knew that the government didn't have a right to do that, so he sued. Well, Mugabe was even less impressed when he sued, and he threw him in prison. Uh, he was in prison for five years, but he finally won his case, and uh, he came out and he established Econet uh, as his company. And today, uh, Econet uh, has annual sales uh, or net income of $3 billion dollars. And today, practically everybody in Zimbabwe and all of Africa, they all have cell phones. So the government said, no, you can't do that. But he didn't see that as legitimate. 
and instead of obeying, he sued. Uh, two, governing authorities are not to be obeyed when obedience to their commands requires us to disobey God. Civil disobedience is justified when the authorities requires us to disobey God. Christians are to be law-abiding citizens, but if the government does not allow us to talk about Christ, uh, then we're uh, to disobey. Now, this is an important point because during uh, the 1930s, many Christians in Germany obeyed the Third Reich and they used Romans 13. They went on to support Hitler and silently supported the killing of millions of Jews. So let me summarize. <clears throat> there are three reasons Christians are to submit to government authority. Because it is established by God, because government authorities are servants of God, and because it gives you a greater opportunity to share Christ and your story. But the state loses its legitimate authority when it ceases to act as God's servant. Then Christians are called to civil disobedience. Now, in our day of political division, where our country is divided down the middle, when some people disagree with what the government is doing, I find they are way too quick to decide, I don't have to obey the government. The government's not legitimate. But Paul says, not so fast. God instituted government. Christians are to submit to government authority. God doesn't want chaos. Everybody can't decide what's right for them to do and do whatever they want. God instituted government for our good. So when you disagree with what government leaders are doing, either at the national level or at the state level, be careful how you respond, lest you find yourself on the wrong side with God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for Apostle Paul's words in Romans 13, telling us that government authority has been established by you and government leaders are your servants. Help us to understand as Christians how to respond and be good citizens. And uh, we pray that we can be such good citizens that we're free to share our story and share you, your son, with our friends, the people who may not know you. I want to give you a moment right now just to talk to God. Would you tell him what you heard today and uh, how you want to uh, be a good citizen? Uh, you pray right now. Thank you, Father, for uh, this text in the Bible and uh, what you teach us about government and uh, responding to it. Help us to obey. Help us to be good citizens and uh, help us to obey you uh, first. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.